These towers and spires are part of Oxford University, the oldest university in Britain. Students have been coming here for 800 years. It began in the 12th century with small groups of teachers giving lessons in churches. Today, the university is a federation of 35 colleges with hundreds of buildings and a total of 12,000 students. It's a place of young people and old traditions. Here, teachers are called dons and still wear black gowns. Students are taught one-to-one -one in the Socratic tradition. At the university library, you can still see notices written in Latin, the ancient language of scholars. Students at Oxford are surrounded by beautiful stone buildings and by reminders of the university's long history and old traditions. This is Hartford College, one of the smaller colleges in the university. About 200 students live and work here. But life at Oxford is not all work. There are clubs and societies for every interest and every kind of sport. This is croquet, which began as a French game, but is now more popular in Britain. The Sheldonian Theatre, used for concerts and university ceremonies. Opposite the Sheldonian is the most famous shop in Oxford, where students and dons buy books. There are books on every subject and one of the largest book rooms in the world with seven kilometers of shelves. Oxford has a large number of pubs and cafes where you can buy cheap food or have a drink with friends. In term time, they're full of students. In summer, the tourists take over. Two rivers flow slowly through the city and past the colleges. This boat is called a punt. If you visit Oxford or Cambridge, you should try punting on the river. It's fun, but it's not as easy as it looks. You should also visit some of the beautiful gardens in and around Oxford. This garden has a maze. First, you must find the centre of the maze. It can take quite a long time, and it's just as difficult to find the way out. North of Oxford, the River Avon runs through the town of Stratford-upon-Avon, the birthplace of England's greatest poet and dramatist. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. William Shakespeare spent most of his working life in London, but he grew up in this house in Stratford, and he returned to Stratford in his old age. Little is known about his early life, but he probably attended this school. It's in the centre of the town which still has many other buildings from Shakespeare's time. 
He was still a teenager when he married Anne Hathaway. They lived in this thatched cottage and had three children. Then, at the age of 24, Shakespeare left for London, where he became one of the greatest dramatists of all time. Wales is a land of green hills, forests and farms. Most of the people speak English, but there is also a Welsh language and a Welsh culture. Every year in August, in an enormous tent, there's a national festival of Welsh music, poetry, dance and song. The festival is called the Eisteddfod. Eisteddfod is a Welsh word which means a meeting. This choir is singing the same song as the first choir because the Eisteddfod is a competition. At the end of the festival, the winners will be chosen. This is North Wales, where you can follow mountain paths for miles and miles. It's a good place to learn climbing too, and to enjoy all kinds of outdoor activities. A good way to see Wales is on horseback, and you don't have to be an expert rider. You can get away from the crowds and ride through woods and green hillsides with streams and waterfalls flowing down into the valleys. The Welsh name for these falls is Rhaeadr Wenol. It means swallow falls. They are at better Sequoid, which means a warm place in the wood. This is the view from the top of a hill called Great Orm's Head on the north coast. It's a long, hard climb to the top, but if you prefer, you can take the tram. Llandidno, the town where the tram begins its climb, is a popular seaside resort. These signs are in Welsh and in English. It's the same all over Wales. Near Llandidno is Conwy, where the river Conway flows into the sea. In the past, Conway's harbour was busy with fishing boats and boats exporting copper and slates. Now they are mostly pleasure boats. But there are still a few fishermen left, and you can still buy fish that is fresh from the sea. Everyone in Wales can speak English but about 20% of the people use both English and Welsh.
About 700 years ago, Edward I, the English king, conquered Wales. He built strong stone castles like this one to show his power. In this folk dancing group, the women are wearing the tall black hats and long dresses of the Welsh national costume. Folk dancing is still popular in Wales, and it's an important part of the national Eisteddfod. Bath is an unusual city because it was built for leisure and health. Most of its elegant houses were built in the 18th century when Bath became a fashionable spa, a place where rich people came to drink the healthy water that rises up here from deep underground. The houses were built with the pale golden colored stone from the nearby hills. The work of artists in stone, both ancient and modern, can be seen all over the city. Some of the terraces in Bath were built in a crescent or circular shape. This is the Royal Crescent, the first terrace ever built as a crescent. These elegant classical buildings and broad streets replaced older houses. You might think that Sally Lunn was a very important person. In fact, she was a street seller of cakes and buns who invented a new kind of bun. Well, buns are eaten with tea, and tea is important to the British. Some of Bath streets are closed to cars. So walking around, relaxation and pleasant conversation are as popular as they were in the 18th century. In those days, the favourite meeting place, the social centre of Bath, was this building the pump room. Nowadays you can drink tea here in the elegant atmosphere of the 18th century. These sedan chairs were used to carry rich people who didn't want their fine clothes to get dirty in the streets. The pump room was built over a spring where natural hot water comes up from underground. This water contains many minerals which are good for you. Every day, one million litres pour out of the ground at a temperature of 49 degrees centigrade. The English were not the first to enjoy this warm, healthy water. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Romans built hot baths, swimming pools and a temple here. After the Romans left Britain, their buildings disappeared under new buildings and streets. But when the great Roman bath was found in 1878, its metal pipes were still working and its stone columns were still supporting the street above it.
These 18th century bathers did not know that a bigger Roman bath lay hidden nearby. The river in Bath is called the Avon, a common name for rivers in Britain. The bridge was inspired by a famous Italian bridge in Florence. Near Bath, you can visit beautiful gardens and classical country houses. This one was a private home, but now it's a school. The Kennet and Avon Canal connects Bath in the west of England to London in the east. A canal boat holiday is a good way to see the English countryside. Beside the canal, you can stop at old country pubs for good cheap food or to enjoy a chat and a drink in the cosy atmosphere. In summer, Cricket is played in towns and villages all over England. There's a lot to see in this part of England. The oldest monument is Stonehenge, built 3,000 years before the Romans came. This is Plymouth. Around the world there are nearly 40 other Plymouths, all named by people who sailed from here in the 16th and 17th centuries. At that time, the other great sea power was Spain. In 1588, Spanish ships attacked England. The English ships were under Sir Francis Drake, Plymouth's hero. Drake was playing a game of bowls when he heard the news. There is time, he said, to finish the game and to win the battle. Nowadays, bowls is more popular with elderly people than with sailors. The point of the game is to get your ball close to the white ball. Good try, madam, but the other was better. In the early 17th century, men and women left from here to build a new life in America. The people who sailed to America on the Mayflower were religious refugees. In America, they named their new home Plymouth. It's now a town in the state of Massachusetts. The English Plymouth of today is Devon's largest city. It's an interesting city to visit and many of the houses overlooking the sea are hotels, guest houses, or bed and breakfasts. A bed and breakfast is a private house which offers a room and breakfast. Guest houses are like hotels, but usually smaller and cheaper. Most British people today have a small breakfast but on holiday you get the traditional British hot breakfast of bacon and eggs and sausages and beans too, if you're lucky. The countryside of Devon has narrow country roads with high banks on both sides which protect you from the wind. Devon is a green hilly county with many rivers and estuaries. On the south coast, these tidal estuaries run inland for five or six kilometers between the fields and woods. Salcombe is a popular holiday town on the Kingsbridge estuary. Here you can hire a boat and explore. It's one of the most popular places in Britain for sailing. One reason for its popularity is the climate. This area is the southernmost part of Britain, so it's a little warmer than elsewhere. Another good thing is the absence of big modern hotels. 
they are not allowed in this protected area of natural beauty. Lobsters are plentiful in the estuary. They're collected in this holding pen and then taken in for sale to Salcombe's restaurants and pubs. <laughs> the local drink in Devon is a strong cider called Scrumpy. It's made from apples using a traditional process. When the apples have been cut up, the pieces are scooped up with a wooden shovel and carried to a press. The pieces are spread by hand into a thick, flat layer of apple. This straw makes it possible to put many layers of apple one above another. The lid of the press is placed on top, making a giant sandwich. The cogwheels begin to turn, and the juice is squeezed out, quickly at first. But as the press gets tighter, the wheels get harder to turn. Now the apple layers have been pressed almost as far as they can go. But there's still a bit of juice in these pieces around the edge. They'll go back into the press until the last drop of juice has come out. A few months from now, this apple juice will be good scrumpy. That's lovely. <laughs> St. Michael's Mount, an island off the south coast of Cornwall. When the water is low, you can walk along a stone road from the island to the mainland. But at high tide, the people who live here must use the ferry. The mainland village of Maratsayan is half a kilometre from the island. It has no harbour so a special kind of ferry is needed. It's called a duck, because, like a duck, it can go on land or sea. There's no school on the island, so for this boy, the journey to school is an adventure. And if the weather's bad, he has the perfect excuse for being late. The building at the top of the island belongs to the National Trust, an organisation that looks after historic monuments and protects beautiful countryside. Before that, it was a family home. And before that, it was a monastery. The monks who lived on St Michael's Mount had come from a French island of the same name, Mont Saint-Michel. Living in Cornwall is almost like living on an island. You are never more than 25 kilometres from the sea. The peninsula of Devon and Cornwall is the only part of southern England that still has an important fishing industry. This is the fish market at Newlyn. Some of the fish sold here 
will end up on the tables of British homes and restaurants. But there are buyers here from Scandinavia, Germany and France too. These are the ruins of a Cornish industry that has almost disappeared. It's hard to guess what the buildings were. In fact, they were mines. A hundred years ago, Cornwall had 600 copper, tin, lead and zinc mines. This may look like a ruin, but in fact, it's a modern open-air theatre. It's not far from Land's End, the most westerly point in Britain where the Atlantic Ocean crashes against the hard grey rocks and cliffs. On the northwest coast, we come to St. Ives, a small seaside town. Its narrow streets and white stone houses built on the side of a hill are typically Cornish. It's a quiet place for most of the year, but in summer it's crowded with people on holiday. St. Ives is also the home of artists and craftsmen. Craftsmen who have lived here include the famous potter, Bernard Leach, who died a few years ago. His wife, Janet Leach, still works here. Like her husband, Janet Leach admires Japanese pottery. She uses a Japanese kick wheel and some of the techniques of the Kenzan potters. Leach pottery has become famous because it combines the best qualities of traditional Western and Eastern pottery. It's about as thin as it needs to be now, I think. The Leach studio is open to visitors, who come to see and to buy. It's one of several galleries and exhibitions in St. Ives. It's surprising in a little seaside town to find art galleries and exhibitions of a high standard. But it's easy to see why so many artists have decided to live here. When people think of 20th century art, they often think of abstract art. One of the leaders of the abstract movement in British sculpture lived here. Barbara Hepworth came here from London in 1940 to find the piece that she needed for her work. When she died here, she wanted her home, studio and garden to be open for everybody to visit. Hepworth described her work as a search for a universal or abstract vision of beauty. Now her sculptures can be seen in cities outside Britain, as well as here in St. Ives. Only 60 kilometres from London, Brighton's nickname in the 19th century was London by the Sea. Brighton was, and still is, one of Britain's most popular seaside resorts. Queen Victoria was rather too serious to enjoy Brighton, but an earlier king, George IV, built a palace here. Now elegant buildings stand beside popular seaside entertainments, this mixture gives Brighton its special character. Do you 
Along the seafront is the promenade, where deck chairs can be hired. Extending out over the sea is the old pier, a palace of fun and traditional seaside entertainment since 1901. Rock is a kind of sweet. It's very hard and tastes of peppermint sugar. Another name for this is a chippy. It's where you buy the traditional British takeaway snack. Or you can eat it in the chippy. Along beside the beach goes the oldest electric train in Britain. It was first used in 1883, long before the days of the bikini and the all-over suntan. <laughs> 